Okay, so um, as I was saying, uh, this is the sixth week on biblical languages, and just where we've been these uh, these past six weeks, we started out looking at the history of just the languages that the original, that the Bible was originally written in, so Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And then uh, the second week I give you just a little taste of the Greek language. Um, <coughs> then what else did we do? We looked at the third week, we looked at issues in how scripture has been brought from those times when it was first written on down the timeline to us today so that we can be sure that the Bibles that we read today, our modern translations, are what was intended, what God inspired in those original writers. We looked at last week a, a survey of English, modern English translations and just the issues that go into that. And today what I want to do is give you uh, what's called there on your sheet, a brief history of the English Bible. And I want to give you a sense of, maybe I should have done this before last week's, version, uh, last week's class, uh, but I want to give you a sense of how the Bible got from uh, just through the course of the English language, how it got to where it is today. So 650 years ago, there was no English translation of the entire Bible. And so only those who could read Hebrew or Greek or Latin, one of the translated languages, could read the Bible for themselves. 400 years ago, there were more than a dozen translations, and people were divided and confused and wondering, you know, which translation do we use? And then King James of England commissioned the first, what was known as the authorized version of the Bible, so that there would be one common Bible that the English-speaking world would use. And eventually, of course, the King James... Uh, the language of the King James fell out of common usage. And so I want to take you through that history today. Um, now, the translation of parts of the Bible, and again, today I'm specifically talking about in the English language, probably started when the English language first started. So not that languages start on a given year, they gradually evolve, but one of the first evidences of any kind of English um, rendering of the Bible would, is Cademan. And the earliest original that we have is uh, from, of his is by AD 670. And this is Old English. So if you read that on your first page, uh, you can read it looks very little like our current English, but that's what Old English looks like. And so what Cademan did in the English of the year 670 it, they weren't really translations. Even to use the word paraphrase would be uh, a, a bit looser than paraphrasings, but these are, he put them into poems. So particularly stories from Genesis, Exodus, and Daniel. And so if you read that, you, you might recognize that there are some words, like that third word is became almighty, and you see Adam and Eve in that first line. And in the second line, fighter, uh, you see father, and then it kind of falls apart from there. But <laughs> uh, you can compare the Old English with a more modern translation of what Cademan wrote. But this is some of the first English rendering of our Bible. So you skip ahead uh, about uh, 700 years to John Wycliffe. And Again, uh, the only way I can put this into uh, the, the history of the English Bible into 40 minutes is it's a, as the title of the class is, a, very, a brief history of the English Bible. So there are many, many versions that I won't be covering, but I'm covering in the 40 minutes that I have the, the key points that can fit into 40 minutes. And uh, there will be other, there are other Bibles, translations, and versions <coughs> that I'll be missing. And there goes 30 seconds of my time just explaining that. So let's move on. John Wycliffe. Uh, he had the first complete English translation of the entire Bible, and that was in 1382. It was in Middle English, so while Cademan's was Old English, uh, Wycliffe's was Middle English, and I'll show you an example of that that's later down on the page. So this was in manuscript form, meaning it was written by hand. This was before the printing press. It took 10 months to produce one copy of the Bible. It was a translation of a translation, meaning he didn't use the original Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. He used the Latin Vulgate. Uh, Saint Jerome, at the end of the fourth century, did a Latin translation of scripture that had been commonly used 
up till that time. And so his was a translation of that Latin translation. John Wycliffe is known as the father of English prose because before him, uh, there was very little written in the English language that wasn't poetry. So he, he in, in a sense, introduced prose writing to the English language. He's also known as the first Protestant. Centuries before Martin Luther, um, he was, Wycliffe was very, uh, he was a political activist. Uh, it, there was questions raging such as who should rule England, uh, the king or the pope? And depending on which king was in power or queen was in power, they, uh, maybe the, the England was either subject to the pope or not too much or just a little. But this was the big political debate. And Wycliffe was very strongly arguing for the sovereignty of England and its uh, independence from the pope. Um, he believed that it's the right and duty of everyone to read scripture for himself. And he wanted to break the power of the Roman church by placing the Bible in everyone's hands. And so the authorities were the Roman church, so you see that didn't go over well with the authorities. His influence, uh, his was, after his translation, the only English Bible for the next 145 years. And even though this was 1382, many of his phrasings are still with us. And so if you read, on that sheet there, I'm just looking at here. Yeah, if you read on that sheet there, even though the spelling is different from ours, you read that and you can see this looks a lot like the Lord's Prayer, as many of us grew up knowing. Our Father that art in heaven, and, and the spelling's a bit messed up. Yeah. How would be Thy name? Thy kingdom come to, but be Thy will done in earth as in heaven. And it sounds very much like the Lord's Prayer that we know of. Uh, so his influence carries on even to our modern translations. The Roman Catholic Church didn't like the idea of the Bible being put in everyone's hands. They insisted that the common man cannot understand scripture without a priest to explain it to him. So it, it makes no sense for you to be able to read the Bible because you can't understand it anyway. So they forbade the translation of, of uh, the language the translation of the Bible into the language of the people. He died of natural causes. Um, he was condemned as a heretic after his death, and so um, having had a burial wasn't good enough because of what the heretic he was, so they actually years later dug up his body and burned him, so <laughs> they burned him, and so he couldn't have a proper burial. He didn't so, care at this time. Well, no. At least he was dead. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we move on to the 16th century with William Tyndale. Uh, oh, yes, sir. I'm not meaning to steal your thunder, but Wycliffe is always often referred to as the morning star of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. That the People in England, when they actually read the Bible for themselves, they said, hey, wait a minute, this is not what we've been hearing. And that really was the beginning of the Reformation idea. And Wycliffe was a gift of God. He was an amazing man. Anyway. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> William Tyndale. Uh, so, so now, as we're skipping ahead to the 1500s, the printing press had been invented in the 1400s by Johann, Johann Gutenberg. And so William Tyndale produced the first printed English Bible. By printed, I mean by a printing press. It was not complete. Uh, he did the New Testament. He completed that in 1525. The Pentateuch, meaning the first five books of the Bible in 1530 of the Old Testament, and then Jonah in 1531. And so, so it wasn't a complete Bible. Uh, he was convinced, Tyndale was, that in order for England to be evangelized, the people must have the Bible in English. Uh, so at that time, the most common Bible was the Latin Bible. People didn't read the Latin Bible. People didn't read Latin often, but that was the Bible that you know the priests told them what was in it, and that was supposed to be good enough. Um, so Johann Gutenberg, again, a century before, had invented the printing press in 1450. By the way, just in case you're ever on Jeopardy, uh, the first book printed by Gutenberg's printing press was the Latin Vulgate Bible. 
So if you're ever on Jeopardy um, <laughs> and you win money, send me some. But, uh, and that was in 1455. So the reason Tyndale felt the need to get an English translation, because remember, Wycliffe had done one already in the 1300s, and it was complete, was first of all that a lot of Wycliffe's words had already become obsolete. Uh, you know, as the English language changes and evolves, and you can read, you know, on the previous page, we looked at the example of the Lord's Prayer. Um, also, Wycliffe, remember, had done his translation from the Latin translation. And what Tyndale desired was a translation from the original, from the, from the Greek, from the Hebrew. And so he used the Greek text. Um, it, it was the best text that they had of the day. And uh, so it wasn't as good as what we have now, the Greek text that he was going from. And actually, the text that he used had been put together a few decades earlier by a fellow named Erasmus, who he was kind of in a race. He, he was competing against other people to come up with the first compiled Greek text. And there was a bit of a race, and haste made a little bit of uh, waste. And so it wasn't the best Greek text, but he, uh, it, he won the race. He, he got his published first. And it, it contained some errors, but it was, uh, you know, it became the standard Greek text. And since that time, there have been improvements in what we found mm -hmm. of the, you know, the correct Greek text, and I'll talk about that later. But his Erasmus was, his was the Greek text that was used by William Tyndale uh, to translate the Bible in English and by Martin Luther to translate the Bible for the German people. Now, in England, it was forbidden for any man of his own authority to translate the Holy Scriptures. So what, needed, what uh, Tyndale needed to do was to get special permission from a bishop to uh, kind of under, uh, under the auspices of a bishop to translate the Bible. And the bishop said no, he, was, uh, he just didn't want to mess with that. So Tyndale left for the European, he left England for the European mainland, and he never went back home to England. But while he was on the continent, I can't remember, I think it was in France, but I could be wrong. Uh, by 1526, he started, uh, he had the, the New Testament printed, and he started smuggling them into England. So Bibles were smuggled into England in any merchandise, uh, barrels, sacks of flour and corn, whatever they could find to, uh, to shove the Bibles in. And the Bible started pouring into England, this uh, smuggled contraband. The church found out about it, and they bought as many as they could, but not to put in the pews, to burn them. You know, so they, they saw that there was this influx of these uh, terrible Bibles, these Bibles coming in. They didn't want the people to have these Bibles, so the church uh, bought as many as they could burn them. Uh, so the Roman Catholic authorities, they were just generally outraged at what Tyndale had done, uh, translating the Bible for the people to read. And... Um, that's just bizarre to us now. <laughs> he was arrested in 1535, held in a castle dungeon for 18 months. Uh, he, he was actually in Brussels at the time. So England had uh, ordered the, uh, the, the authorities in Brussels to hold him there till they could have a trial. So they held him in a castle dungeon for 18 months. And he was eventually, he was executed. Um, he was burned at the stake. He was actually hanged and then burned. And his dying words were a prayer, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Um, two years later, King Henry VIII, not knowing, <clears throat> not knowing that it was Tyndale's translation, saw all these Bibles that were around, and he ordered that every church display one book of the whole Bible in English. So the king of England's eyes had been opened, um, and I think he, he didn't know, as I said, that it was Tyndale's translation. I think if King Henry VIII had known it had been Tyndale's translation, uh, given that Tyndale had just been executed, he would have probably, the king probably would have not wanted a widespread. But he didn't know. He saw, hey, English Bibles, that's a good thing. And no, check, no separation of church and state at the time, so he ordered that every church have a Bible displayed. All right. <laughs> Uh, Tyndale, his translation in the 1500s was the foundation for the King James. In fact, 90% of his words, that as, as he had written it, 90% of them carried over into the King James Version. Uh, more surprising to me, uh, 
75% of the words of the Revised Standard Version that came out in 1952, 75% of those wordings were Tyndale's wordings. So his influence carried on a long time. Okay, questions so far? All right. I strained my vocal cord singing last Sunday and then <laughs> trying to rest it all week. Okay, next, um, I want to talk about the Geneva Bible. So in 1560, so we're, we're scooting ahead about three decades from Tyndale. It was done by Protestants who were in exile in Geneva. This was under the reign of uh, the, the Queen, Queen Mary of England, Bloody Mary. She was strongly Catholic. She led a severe persecution against Protestants. And so there was definitely going to be no... Uh, printing of the Bible in England, so they fled to uh, Geneva, where they could freely, you know, translate and make uh, make a new translation of the Bible. In this Geneva Bible, the Old Testament was mostly a revision of a previous version that had been called the Great Bible. Um, the New Testament was mostly a revision of Wycliffe's work. Uh, it, and the Geneva Bible became the dominant household Bible of the English-speaking Protestants. It was gradually <coughs> replaced by the King James, but that didn't come along until about 50 years later. It was uh, one claim to fame, maybe you'll be on Jeopardy and this could be an answer, but uh, it was the Bible that was brought over to America on the Mayflower. So at the time when the first settlers came to America, they had the Geneva Bible. It was the first English Bible to use the modern chapter and verse divisions. So you have to keep in mind when Paul and, and when, when everyone was writing the Bible, whether Old Testament or New Testament, they didn't write in their letters chapters and verses. Those are modern, uh, modern things. And so it's the Geneva Bible that first used the modern chapter and verse divisions that we use now. Okay, uh, the King James Version is the next one I want to talk about. The King James, otherwise known as the Authorized Version, when it was, it came out in 1611, and from that time, it was essentially the exclusive <coughs> Bible of the English-speaking world for almost 300 years. It was the one Bible that united the church, strengthened believers, and brought untold millions of souls to Christ. Um, it had a uh, people still recognize it for its literary beauty that helped shape the English language. Um, and it, it's just, you know, a lot of people still vehemently stick to the King James, but just uh, even a generation or two ago, you know, this was the version of the Bible to use. Well, I want to talk about why, why they came up with the King James version. Why this new version? Why did they need a new translation? And for one thing, it was recognized that there had been mistranslations in the, uh, going back to Wycliffe, uh, I'm sorry, Wycliffe and the Geneva Bible and all the others, it had been recognized that from the original Greek text, there had been some mistranslations. Also, James didn't, King James, didn't uh, like many of the marginal notes. Uh, just like we in our study Bibles, we have lots of notes. Uh, back then, there were marginal notes, and oftentimes they were very, uh, very opinionated, very uh, lots of bitter stuff going on, lots of lots of commentary that you wouldn't expect in a Bible. And James didn't particularly like a lot of the marginal notes because uh, a lot of them uh, seemed to strongly imply that it was okay to depose a king, and he particularly didn't like that. So in 1604. King James appointed 47 revisers, and these were the best Greek and Hebrew scholars of the day. Um, and it was a very organized thing that they did. Uh, each revisor, each person, they broke up into different groups, and each person got a section of the Bible. You know, you take Genesis, you take Exodus, and they did their translation from, you know, depending on what part of the Bible, Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic. And then when one person was finished with his section of the Bible, they traded and they revised and reviewed each other's. And then when they were done, they traded again and traded again so that every portion of the Bible went through each of the 47 individuals. And so, as I said, it was a very organized uh, thing <coughs> trying to just get the best possible translation. 
Uh, the rule was no margin notes, because <laughs> James said, you know, no, no margin notes this time, except if a Hebrew or Greek term needed to be uh, explained or defined. Um, so it went through, yes? Um, if I missed it, I'm sorry. Um, who were the 47 men? Um, I, I don't know their names or what group. It was just 47 of the best Greek and Hebrew scholars, scholars. that King James had appointed. And I don't know what, where he got these names from. Yes? The, the significance of this is that this was the first Bible that was translated by translation committee. All the other works had been work of um, either one individual or, or a very small group of people. Yeah. And the, what they did is they set up a remarkable quality control system that allowed them to come up with a vastly improved uh, translation. So the the genius of this thing, um, James the first was actually James the sixth out of Scotland. He was a very smart guy. He, he came to the throne when he was one year old. Yeah, <laughs> had some very had some very smart people around him, and they recognized that in order to come up with the very best translation, they needed to get a lot of very good people involved. And so the organization and the system that they put together was really remarkable, and it really hasn't changed since then. Yeah. Uh, now we've gotten better manuscripts since then, you know, more ancient manuscripts, but this. King James um, Translation Committee was was a remarkable event of how different the approach to translation came. It was really, really something. What year did they start that? Uh, 1604. 1604. And it was finally published in 1611. Um, so then the next one I want to talk about is the, the oh, but before I get to that, um, it went through, the King James went through many, many, many revisions because immediately once published, it was recognized that there had been a lot of typographical errors, just there were a lot of problems with it. And so uh, people started, there, there were revisions, both uh, well, a lot of private revisions. So people just privately started, let me, let me redo this, but without the typographical errors. So lots of revisions to it. Um, and then people wanted to, you know, kind of, I guess it's kind of like now, you go to Amazon, there's not just the NIV, there's the, the Ryrie Studdo Bible and the this and that. There's all kinds of uh, you know, private companies that have done that. Well, a lot of people wanted to do revisions of the King James, not changing, altering the translation, but maybe if they recognized what they thought was a typographical error, or lots of times they wanted to include their margin notes and stuff like that. But the King James, as, as a translation as a whole, uh, that came out in 1611, and through the 1600s and 1700s and 1800s, this was, uh, you know, it gradually replaced the Geneva Bible, and it was the English Bible. Well, by the late 1800s, there was seen a need for a revision of the King James. So there was the English Revised Version. And in America, one similar to it was, I think, the... Uh, is it the American Revised, I can't remember, the American Revised Version, I think this was called. But uh, what I have there on your sheet in England, the revised English. Standard version. What's that? Revised Standard Version. Oh, wait a minute, I'm thinking no. a different one. That was 1952. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the American, American Revised, revised version, version was in yeah. America. Yeah. And But in England, they were doing the English Revised Version. Uh, so this is the late 1800s. The New Testament was completed in 1881. The Old Testament in 1885. The reason it was felt the need to revise the King James after uh, you know, almost three centuries was that, first of all, English words, as, they, as the language continues to evolve, English words had changed meaning. There, was, uh, there had been a discovery of new Greek manuscripts um, and Hebrew. Uh, when the King James Version was published, there had been no such thing as the science of textual criticism. Textual or biblical criticism is the science uh, that I talked to you about a few weeks ago of taking these different manuscripts, and maybe they're slightly varied from each other, and deciding which one is more authoritative, which one is probably closer to the original. So that didn't really exist back in the day of King James, but that science had grown in the past, you know, till the 1800s. 
Um, also, there was just better knowledge of Hebrew and Greek. So I want to talk about those different points. First of all, how words change meaning. I have on your sheet just some different things, uh, some different verses from the King James. Uh, first of all, 1 Thessalonians 4.15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. What do I mean? What are we preventing them from doing? Well, the word prevent, you know what prevent means now, but in the King James in that language, prevent meant proceed. Uh, we shall not go proceed or go before them which are asleep. And so for us to read the King James now, or even in the 1800s, and see that word prevent, it doesn't make sense because the word had changed. Another one, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. Back then in the 1600s, the word let, like let me go to the store, let me ride my bike, let meant restrain. It meant the opposite of what it does now. So the King James Version, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, said, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now led it will let until he be taken out of the way. Uh, the American Standard Version says, For the mystery of lawlessness doth already work, only there is one that restraineth now until he be taken out of the way. So one of them translate, the King James said let, but more modern translations talk about restrain. The word totally changed 180 degrees of meaning. <coughs> Ephesians 2 3. The King James says, among whom also, I know I'm taking these verses totally out of context, I'm sorry, I just want to be concise, and I, I just want to talk about that individual word. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh. So conversation, we think of it as talking, but conversation in the day of King James meant <coughs> the way you walk, the way you live your life. And so the American Standard Version, the update, it says, among whom we also once lived instead of had our conversation. And more modern versions may say walked or lived our lives or stuff. But the point is, words drastically, some have cha had changed meaning since the King James. Any questions on that? So the King James was, as Pastor Al said, the first with uh, uh, organized uh, you know, translation of, of the English Bible by committee with such quality control. And I mentioned the English Revised Version because to me, uh, it's the first in the long <coughs> series of revisions that we've had since the King James in this desire to keep the English Bible uh, updated with regard to how the language changes, with regard to uh, newer and better uh, uh, ability to handle the different manuscripts. And so now, today we have all our different Bible translations, and this is what the video was about last week. We have the NIV and the ESV and the New King James. And if you, it's fascinating to me, and, and if you want to look in the preface of those Bibles to read, I just like reading in my NIV the preface about what went into, how they, you know, what was the occasion, why did they decide to do it, why did they, uh, you know, what went into putting it together, or any version of the Bible, the ESV, the ESV, the New King James Version, the NASB. So it's neat to read those, at least it's neat to me, and get a sense of what went into doing this translation. Um, some of these Bibles have websites, so if you'd like to learn more about the ESV, it's an easy website to remember, it's esv.org, and so you can read uh, all about what went into that. So as I think about this, this history of the English Bible, and how to applying this to my life, uh, one thing that I think uh, that, that I do and we can all do is thank God that we have a translation of the Bible. You think of what Wycliffe and Tyndale and all those uh, folks early on went through um, it, you know, to get the Bible into the language of the people, uh, but that we have a translation, that there was the wisdom and skill of the translators, the freedom that the translators have had, even of our modern translations, to, to make those. Uh, we can thank God that we have not just a Bible somewhere, not just one sitting in the church, in the sanctuary, but we have many, many copies available to us. I just think, you know, on my nightstand, there's my NIV and my Greek text, and Shannon's got her NIV and, and her New American Standard, 
And you know, it's like, oh, what is this version saying? What's that? And in my house, with all my little kids, uh, you know, kids don't want to do anything. Um, go pick your clothes off off the floor, and, and Daniel, <laughs> I can't. It's too hard. But you are not allowed in my house to say, uh, uh, th no, the Bible. It's too far away. It's all the way across the house. So if you do that, we tell you about Wycliffe and Tyndale. <laughs> no, <that was. laughs> details. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it, it is just neat to have so many copies. And even if they weren't in my house, uh, they're available at the library. They're available at Amazon.com. They're all over the place. And I'm very grateful that we have these. Um, another application, just uh, as we, we can be thankful that God has preserved his word through the centuries and given us the freedom to have all this. First of all, that he has preserved his word. Um, but just become a Bible reader. Fall in love with the Bible. We should all be uh, Bible readers. Um, we could also ask God for wisdom in understanding his word and applying it to our lives. When Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he, he would often start by saying, uh, haven't you read the scriptures that say blah, blah, blah. He would quote the Old Testament. Well, of course they had read the scriptures. He wasn't asking, hey, by the way, have you read this? He knew they had read it. They had the whole thing memorized. Uh, but what he was asking, haven't you read this? He was basically saying, yeah, I know you've read it, but you're not applying it to your lives. So don't be like that. Read the Bible and apply it to your lives. James wrote, do not merely listen. This is not King James. James. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Any questions? Comments? I break the baklava, but I didn't bring it today. <laughs> Let's pray, and then we can dis discuss more if we want to. Father, I thank you that you've given us your word. I thank you that you've given folks through the ages the ability and the freedom to translate your word from the original language. Just that you have preserved your word so that even though uh, it was originally written thousands of years ago, that the modern translations that we have now are what was originally written and translated for us to read, for us to understand. And I ask, Lord, that you help us to fall in love with your word, to be in love with your word of truth, and to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When okay. did they start yes. selling them? And What's that? When did they start selling Bibles? They smuggled them in, so they were just well, giving them away. I know, uh, that's interesting, I, you know, what I read in history, uh, I, when I read about uh, once they came into England, what I read was that the Roman Catholic Church was buying them so that they could burn them. So it seems to me based on that, 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 they, that they were, <laughs> but they, you're asking but when were they sold? Openly where people could say, okay, I can yeah. go to this store. Um, was it a cost? Prohibited? Uh, when did Amazon start? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know.